Um, my next job is to introduce the, the last speaker. She's the mysterious woman that came up and allowed me to avoid that Austin Powers moment. <laughs> uh, Leslie Biscoll, many of you may, may know her. Now, Leslie uh, did send a very brief one-line bio, and I said, oh, I, I can't miss this one-line. She's, she's a very modest person. So I had to uh, expand it just, just a touch, so, you know, but not too much. Uh, Leslie is a lawyer who's had a, who had an animal rights practice for 10 years where she acted for individuals and organizations in a variety of animal-related cases. It was the first practice of its kind in Canada, so Leslie was the first animal rights lawyer in this entire country. Uh, her regular job today uh, is in the human rights and poverty law field, but she pursues her interest in justice for animals in a variety of ways including speaking to a variety of organizations, such as law schools in Canada, the United States, and not too long ago, doing an extensive tour of Australian law schools. She also has an excellent TED Talk that you should all go to YouTube when you get home and watch. It's uh, a very good one, and I don't know how many people have watched it, but not enough, because everybody should watch it. Uh, Leslie is also the author of Animals in the Law, the first Canadian law text published by uh, by Irwin uh, on the subject, and then actually that's a book that I put as number two on my must-read for activists in Canada. Number two. Number two. <laughs> Simply it's number one, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, that's my entire list. I'm happy to send it to them, but it uh, contains a lot of books that you wouldn't normally expect to see on a list of that kind. Uh, it doesn't contain any, any real animal but Leslie's book is now uh, number one on that list. <laughs> uh, Leslie is also a mentor to many people, and I've heard countless young women say, I want to talk to Leslie. I want to be like Leslie. And they're in awe of Leslie. She's an icon amongst uh, the younger women, certainly the ones that, uh, uh, that, that I've met and that my colleagues have met. Um, she's also an adjunct professor. I believe her law students, or some of them, are here today, and she teaches animal rights law. Now, I remember one funny, funny moment with Leslie. She's come up to a lot of council meetings and different things. And I remember one time we were driving to Minto Township in southwestern Ontario, very rural area, and it's pitch black. It's the middle of winter, and we're driving down a hill, and there's this sort of small town hall surrounded by probably 200 pickup trucks with gun racks. And, and Leslie's looking at it, and she says to me, I don't want to die tonight. <laughs> well, she didn't. Uh, that was kind of fun. Uh, lots, lots, of, lots of fun experiences. See, that's part of the fun. Lots of fun experiences uh, uh, in this field, and uh, a lot of them with Leslie. And uh, without any further delay, I will turn my phone over to TED Talk extraordinaire person, Leslie. And in fact, having just heard Theo's, I wish I could step outside for a few minutes and rewrite mine because it really <laughs> makes me want to think. Um, but I feel like I'm always doing that in this work. So um, let me stick with what I, I, I thought I could share tonight and uh, hope that it um, help add to the, this um, variety, this great variety we've heard tonight. So um, I left my job as a civil litigator in 1994 to become an animal rights lawyer because I thought there was an important role for lawyers to play in advancing animal rights. And uh, I still think that there is, but it's not exactly the role that I imagined at the time. I've learned a two-part lesson. Uh, part one, the human animal is capable of rational thought, but does not actually think rationally. <laughs> and number two, law is an important tool in the movement to emancipate animals from human exploitation. But it's just one of many tools and one of many social institutions that must transform if we're going to stop the violence that we've institutionalized in our societies and most problematically in our economies. In the course of history, wherever animal advocates have opened their mouths to object to a harm being done to animals by humans, the response by spokespeople for the group activities or industry, increasingly it's 
overwhelming the industry that's causing that harm, has always been to defend the human right to hurt the animal on the basis of some inferiority or defect in non-human animals. It's okay to eat them or wear them or experiment <coughs> them or find them um, because they don't communicate. They don't form meaningful relationships. They don't reason. They don't think. But, you know, it's been 150 years now since Darwin, and we know, all of us, every one of us, and all of those guys who deny it, they know that, of course, animals communicate and have meaningful relationships and think and feel. And what's been deficient all of these years is not the animals, but our own ability to interpret their behavior and to understand them, to understand that, of course, we are all animals who differ from one another in degree but not in kind, right? I didn't make that up, that was Darwin 140 years ago. So if we are, as we like to say, and we continue to say, even as science is proving how rational animals are, well, you know, they're not as rational as we are, they may think, but they can't think about thought. They don't know that they're thinking about the fact that they're thinking. Therefore, we can eat them. So if we really are the ultimate rational creatures, as we say we are, why is it taking so freaking long <laughs> for this scientific knowledge to penetrate mainstream consciousness. I'll say mainstream Western consciousness. It's always struck me, hasn't it struck you, that when any of us, when any animal advocate makes an argument to respond to those things, to prove what we have to prove, that as animals do communicate, we'll cite the newest study about crows, intelligence, or whatever it is that we have to pull, that they do communicate, they do think, they do feel, we are criticized how? What do they say? She's being too emotional, right? Isn't that always the critique? You're being too emotional, when in fact, the arguments that we're making are highly rational. They're specifically rational. And it's those who are defending animal exploitation who are responding with emotional arguments, aren't they? I'm not just calling names here. I mean, I, I really think this is true. My child wants to see an elephant. We're curing disease. The animals present themselves to be killed. <laughs> Have you heard that one from hunters? City people don't understand country life. You know, you've all heard all of these things in the face of our rational arguments. Now the real truth is, I think, we know that it's actually not accurate to try to distinguish between rational and emotional thinking as though they're two separate things, as though we can compartmentalize them in our own minds and turn on one or the other when we think it's appropriate. If it seems we're not thinking rationally, it's because we're more complex than that. We can't be reduced to one or the other. Reason and emotion are intertwined in us, and they're both operating all the time. And the most important lesson, then, that I've learned doing all this work for all these years is not about other animals, but about my conspecifics. It's about human psychology and the mental barriers. That's a word that Rob taught me, right? Conspecifics. I like that. <laughs> my own. Anyway. Uh, I like to throw that around casually as though it's just a normal word, but it's not. It's a big deal for me when I use it. <laughs> so uh, what I've learned is about the mental barriers that, that people erect in order to defend their privilege, our privilege, I, I'm human, and our entitlement to do the things that we really want to do, even if we know that it's causing others to suffer. So at a recent roundtable discussion that uh, called Animals in Society at U of T that was organized by the wonderful Lisa Kramer, who's sitting here somewhere. Uh, uh, professor Kramer uh, was a professor of finance there. Um, one speaker in particular made some comments that I, I thought I'd, I'd share with you. Matthew Feinberg is the assistant professor of organizational behavior, and he was talking about our moral emotions, and he described us as psychological hedonists meaning most people are guided by a preference of pleasure over pain. Not too surprising. So when we're faced with the prospect of change, he says, we start to wonder things like, what sacrifices am I gonna have to make? How is this gonna change my life? How are people gonna view me? So Feinberg described what he called a push-pull model for our own psychology, which I took to mean that we are all in a constant battle between self-interest and doing what we believe to be morally right, right? We rationalize our choices, as we all know. So lesson one for me, humans do not think rationally. <laughs> we think with reason and emotion. We think with morality and with self-interest. 
And it doesn't surprise, I'm sure, anyone in this room because we've all seen it in action, and that's why you're here thinking about this tonight. But the takeaway, I think, for animal advocates is that our job is to try to appeal to both sides of that equation, to acknowledge, to accept, and now to try to deal with it. And that brings me to law. So, uh, in considering legal initiatives to advance animal interests, we have to make rational arguments, of course. We have to bring science to court. We have to rely on the science about our biological kinship with other animals. We have to make direct arguments to court to explain the problem with legal status of sentient creatures who are obviously feeling the pain that we're causing them as property. We've chosen to label them as property so that we can hurt them, and we need to use science and rational arguments to start to dismantle the assumption that that's okay. We have to use rational arguments to try and change the legal status of animals from property to legal persons, so that just like corporations, they can go to court and advance their interests and have someone take it seriously. We have to be able to prove that they feel the harms that we cause them in a way that our conspecifics can understand. So we need science and rational arguments. But we also have to rely on initiatives that confront that psychological barrier that prevent people from making the needed changes. We need to encourage people to confront the ways in which humans and which animals are hurt in pursuit of our pleasures. It would be nice to try to do it the way Theo just described, and I really want to think about that and work on that. But from the legal perspective, when I was thinking more strategically, more lawyerly, um, what do we need? We need information, we need pictures, we need to stick this stuff in your face. Like all the pictures that we saw tonight have an immediate impact, right? That's why it's a cliche, it speaks a thousand words. So we need information, we need pictures. In other words, we need to keep doing a lot of what we've already been doing for quite a long time. And this means using legal tools a little bit more indirectly than I first realized when I set out thinking, you know, it's time to make animals legal persons. So we need to try to empower one another, the people in this room, the people outside this room, the people who would gather that information, like, like Cheryl's organization, who would actually go out on the ice and take photos that they can put up, up against the Government of Canada statements that this is the most humane hunt in the world. We need people who will gather, uh, share, and use that information. We need those photos of animals in factory farms, and have animals that have their legs caught in leg pole traps to produce the uh, Canada goose coat so humanely. We need to collect inspection reports from laboratories. Liz's organization has tried to do that. I don't know if anybody has seen their access to obfuscation campaign when they put in a, a research request for, I think it related to pound seizure in animals, and they got a stack of papers. It was so impressive where actually almost everything was completely blacked out. <laughs> so we need to be able to legally challenge the kind of information that's being kept from us. We need to, uh, to empower advocates who can write reports about conditions in zoos and circuses and not get sued when they do it. We need to complain to consumer protection agencies when industries lie about how humanely their meat and fur trim is produced, like a group called Animal Justice. Uh, the current animal rights lawyers doing some great work in this country uh, are doing. So lawyers can do all of that. Lawyers can empower advocates to acquire information and to publicize it. And the good news is, my friend Kathy said, you're the last speaker, you better end it on a positive note and come up with something good to say. Well, I actually do have something positive, and I don't have to fake it. The good news is that there is a growing interest among law students in this area, and other people, but I'll just speak in my own domain. So we can do more today than ever before. And on that note, I want to give a shout out to my students um, from both U of T and Osgood Law School, who should be home studying for exams, <laughs> but are here tonight and hoping to work for and with all of you one day. And I want to say that it's been really inspirational to engage with them and to see if their commitments, you know, they, I shouldn't admit this while they're here, but they come into class and they talk about things that I feel like I'm not even actually sure my mouth on. They, they know more than I know. They're really, they're on top of these things. They care about them and they're determined to, to keep on the fight. And as I look at colleagues on this panel, um, colleagues all around this room whom I've worked with for decades, um, and, and as I also look out equally happily, if not more so, on faces that I've never seen before. Um, 
all of us wondering together in frustration whether our hard work is getting anywhere, you know, whether the message is getting out. It is. It is getting out. Of course it's not fast enough when we think about the billions of animals and all the horrible things that have already been alluded to tonight. Of course <coughs> it's obscenely slow. But we are not banging our heads against the wall. Of that I'm convinced. It's just that we're fighting against an enormous, complex machine of exploitation. So it's a really big job to bring it down. But think about some of the successes that people have already mentioned in earlier talks tonight. Think about what you've read about how SeaWorld attendance is going down after that film. The increasing number of vegans, you can't even talk about being vegetarian to the new generation. That's scandalous. They're all vegans, and it's not pronounced vegan anymore, right? We know <laughs> it's vegan. There's been a 20% decrease in dairy consumption in North America in the last 20 years. 20%. There's an increase in rescuing pets. Do you notice how many people you talk to who don't, when they see an animal, they'll ask, you, the, the, the animal you're walking, they'll ask, you know, is this a rescue? Everybody talks in those terms now. It's all about rescuing animals. There are elephants moving out of zoos and circuses, and the list goes on and on. So it's a big machine, my friend. <laughs> There's a lot that we have to do. But I think I can stand here and honestly say to you that from everything I have seen and experienced, the, de work, the work that has to be done to dismantle that machine has already begun.